Well, the next speaker is um, Peter Sterling uh, from his lab in Vancouver, and he's going to be talking about the effects of genotoxic stress and splicing. Okay. Thank you very much, Oliver. It's uh, great to be here today and be able to tell you a little bit about what's really a developing project in my lab, which we think is linking um, the transcriptional reprogramming that takes place during the stress response to the composition of protein quality control compartments. And I hope to convince you that, that that's happening. So as we've heard throughout the meeting, um, protein relocalization uh, defines the stress response. And Rodney and Susan gave great talks talking about RAT52, which I, which I show up top here, that relocalizes into foci. And those foci are actually the site of its function in DNA repair. Uh, other proteins move from one cellular compartment to the other. So GAT1 is a transcription factor on the bottom um, that, that moves from the cytoplasm to the nucleus um, in response to nutrient deprivation. So relocalization events can tell you about the mode of action of, of, of your favorite genes. Um, and so my favorite genes have always been genes that, whose mutation leads to chromosome instability. So syn genes are any gene whose mutation leads to an increase in the rate of chromosome loss or rearrangements that lead to marker loss. So when I was a postdoc in Phil Heater's lab, we spent a lot of time cataloging the, the, all the genes in yeast that lead to chromosome instability phenotypes. Um, so at the end of my postdoc, we took the syn gene list that we had made and extracted from the yeast GFP collection all GFP fusions to these syn genes. So we had a little syn proteome array that we subsequently could screen for relocalization using really broad genotoxic stresses. And we chose to expose our syn gene, our, our syn proteome array to uh, UV irradiation, uh, MMS, a DNA alkylating agent you've heard about today and, and or previously, and hydrogen peroxide, an oxidative stress. And then with very low throughput methods, image these GFPs at 100x uh, uh, oil immersion. <clears throat> so the results of the screen are presented here, and, and um, there's a couple of key points to take away. So 41 proteins moved reproducibly in response to these different stresses. There were very few stress-specific relocalization events. In fact, most proteins move in response to all three stresses. Um, and the movements are maybe what you would expect. The most common was movement of a protein into nuclear foci, primarily DNA repair foci, but also other structures, which I'll talk about today, um, as well as proteins moving into and out of the nucleus and into cytoplasmic foci, which can be P-bodies, stress granules, protein aggregates. Um, it's important to note as well that more than half of these, probably closer to two-thirds, have been previously recognized by genome-wide screens from Grant Brown's lab, from Leona Sampson's lab, and of course from Brenda Andrews' lab. So um, one of the proteins that we got interested in, we're obviously trying to focus on the novel relocalization behaviors, and one of those was of a splicing factor called HSH-155, which formed foci in response to MMS and hydrogen peroxide. So HSH-155 is a conserved splicing factor. It's homologous to SF3B1 in humans and is a core component of the U2 SNRP. It's actually part of a subcomplex called SF3B. And it relocalizes, I guess you can see the arrows, to sort of foci that are peripheral to the nucleus and then more rarely to cytoplasmic foci in response to either MMS or peroxide treatment. Importantly, we found that other splicing factors don't relocalize, suggesting that these stresses at some point lead to disassociation of this SF3B complex and allow HSH-155 to go to these structures. So what are these foci was our big question, and this is where a postdoc in my lab, Vina Matthew, came in and really did all the rest of the experiments that I'll talk about today. So through a variety of, of trials, Vina uh, was able to show that HSH-155 foci are actually protein aggregates. And one of the ways in which she did that was by co-localizing HSH-155 with a protein called VHL. VHL is a, a not, a, not a yeast protein, it's a human protein that can't fold properly in yeast. And when you overexpress it at high temperature, it actually serves as a marker for protein aggregates. So VHL and HSH-155 co-localized both at these peripheral nuclear sites and uh, in the cytoplasmic sites, suggesting that we were looking at protein aggregates. And there's actually a pretty big literature on protein aggregate structure or protein quality control sites in yeast. So in the cytoplasm, there's at least two, uh, two flavors of protein aggregates. There's these less dynamic insoluble protein deposits that occur next to the vacuole, and then cytoplasmic quality control bodies or Q bodies that are more amorphous structures um, and potentially more numerous. 
In the nucleus, um, what was called the juxtanuclear quality control compartment is recently redefined as the intranuclear quality control compartment. And this was actually identified uh, through the several marker proteins a few years ago by Grant Brown's lab uh, whole, whole Genome Screen to contain these proteins CMR1, HOS2, APJ1, and PPH21, which will come up later. And then last year it was redefined by Mike Lisby's lab and Baron Bukow's lab as an intranuclear site of protein aggregation called the INC. So when we looked at some of these INC markers, we found that HSH-155 co-localized with, in this case, um, a protein called HOS2, a histone deacetylase. Uh, both at the nuclear and the cytoplasmic sites. And so we wanted to know how the regulation of this splicing factor was actually regulated, or how the localization was regulated. And much like other proteins at protein aggregates, its localization is regulated by molecular chaperones. And I'll, I'll pull up the quantification here, but basically there are two types of chaperones that affect these aggregates. There are disaggregases, like HSP-104, SSC-1, that actually promote the resolution of these protein quality control structures. And if we mutate them, we see both in unstressed cells and, and exemplified and more in the stressed cells, uh, a significant increase in the number of cells that have these foci. And then there are aggregases, HSP42 and BTN2, that actually drive proteins into quality control structures. And when we mutate them, we see no foci at all. So we have HSH155, it's being uh, unfolded and recognized by chaperones. Some of them work to promote its movement into aggregates, others resolve it. Um, APJ1 was a chaperone that I told you was a marker of these ink structures, and we show here that it actually also promotes the dissolution or prevention of these aggregates. Um, similarly, um, I can tell you that deletion of any of those markers from the high throughput screen, CMR1, HOS2, PPH1, all lead to increases. And so they actually specifically increase the localization of this splicing factor in cytoplasmic foci, suggesting that there's some sort of triage between nucleus, uh, nuclear quality control sites and cytoplasmic quality control sites. Um, so why would a splicing factor do this? And I think we heard a little bit about this yesterday. There's actually a characteristic transcriptional program that takes place after stress called the environmental stress response defined by, by Audrey Gash in the early 2000s. One of the hallmarks of, of many environmental stress uh, uh, or uh, of this pathway is the suppression of ribosomal protein genes. And as you may know, ribosomal protein genes are specifically enriched for containing introns and they're highly expressed, such that nine of 10 splicing reactions in yeast actually involve a transcript from a ribosomal protein gene. So gene expression is shut off in about 15 minutes and we actually find, or, or less than that, and we find that splicing efficiency is also reduced within the first half hour. And we started to wonder whether our foci were forming prior to changes in gene expression or after changes in gene expression. And so to do that, we tracked um, the accumulation of HSH-155 at these sites over time. This is a little bit uh, of a dense graph, but I'll, I'll orient you here. The checkered bars are the nuclear sites and the horizontal lines are the cytoplasmic sites. It takes about an hour for a significant number of cells to show um, these nuclear quality control sites and the cytoplasmic sites lag. They appear later, so there seems to be maybe some sort of overflow mechanism from the nuclear sites that, that leads to accumulation in the cytoplasmic sites only later. And then we can wash out MMS and the, these are not permanent, the foci disappear quickly. So MMS induces changes in transcription and, and, and splicing probably early. It induces through the action of chaperones uh, the splicing factor to go to the intranuclear quality control sites and then later to cytoplasmic quality control sites. So is there a connection between the transcriptional response and the, the quality control of this splicing factor? So we're, we're still investigating this and one of the ways that we, we've chosen to do this is by mutating a ribosomal protein gene transcription factor called SFP1. SFP1 is involved in, de novo, or, uh, in you know, maintenance of ribosomal protein gene expression, but when it's deleted, the cells can no longer dynamically respond to stress. So basically, um, in response to TOR signaling, SFP1 moves from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, and that movement is important for the cells to rapidly shut off ribosomal <coughs> protein genes, or to the expression of RP genes in SFP1 mutants is dysregulated. And so I'll show you a couple things here. We looked at um, a couple of different markers of these protein aggregates in SFP1 mutants. One important thing to note is when we looked at a chaperone, APJ1, um, SFP1 has no effect on this localization. So the protein aggregates still form. However, um, when we look at HSH-155, we see that there is basically a complete abrogation of cells that, that show these aggregates. So, and similarly for HOS2, what I didn't tell you is HOS2 also localizes to RP genes. And so we think that, um, you know, 
we, we still have these protein aggregates forming, but in the absence of this transcriptional response uh, or when it's dysregulated, we don't see localization of the splicing factor anymore. And it actually matters which way we shut off RP genes. So for example, a heat shock doesn't cause foci, but hydrogen peroxide does, although both stresses should shut off RP genes. So we're trying to sort of build this into a model where we have um, RP gene expression dropping in response to TOR signaling leading to SFP1 relocalization, um, but that there's potentially a need for a second stress. So we, we think that spliceosomes are displaced in this, under this stress, so we have 90% uh, drop in, in the need for spliceosomes. But RP gene expression shutdown is, is not enough. We think perhaps alkylative or oxidative damage to RNAs or proteins is further leading to the uh, recruitment of HSH-155 to these, aggreg these aggregate structures, or that the specific changes, and we heard yesterday about um, how different stresses lead to slightly different changes in gene expression could be uh, promoting aggregation of this, this factor. So one remaining question is why would the cells want to do this at all? It could be to turn over HSH-155 or maybe pr protect it for recovery. And we have a little bit of evidence that, that it's the latter. So if we look at the levels of this protein under stress um, in the presence of cyclohexamide, we see that it actually turns over very rapidly in untreated cells, but is stabilized significantly um, by, by the treatment with MMS. So we think perhaps HSH-155 is being sequestered at these sites um, and, and protected for subsequent reactivation. Um, so we, we try to draw these huge models, but obviously there's a ton of question marks in, in something like this. And we're, right now we're investigating whether there really is a second signal requiring damage to, to DNA, RNA, or protein. Um, we think this is a great mechanism to study, or a great system to study the triage of proteins to quality control sites because we can create those structures and then control the localization of a specific protein. Inc forms next to the nucleolus, which is kind of compelling because we're talking about ribosome biogenesis, and we think that we're investigating whether or not that's actually significant. And then, of course, the relationship between, we, we have a system now to study the relationship between one substrate that goes between nuclear and cytoplasmic quality control sites, which, um, you know, most previous studies have looked at marker proteins that are prone to aggregate, and now we have an endogenous protein that actually transits these structures that we can investigate. Um, so I'll stop there and just thank Vina again and point you to two posters on completely different topics. Carissa talking about RNA degradation and genome instability and Romulo talking about cisplatin mutation signatures. So if you want to see the breadth of things going on, you can go and visit those two. Thank you. Rodney over here. Peter, n nice story. So what happens if you just lower the amount of ribosomal, one, one ribosomal protein so that you actually make ribosome, quote, ribosomes limiting. Do you get this kind of movement or not? Have you looked? <clears throat> we haven't looked at that. We've done a few things like uh, treating cells with rapamycin and looking at upstream um, and cyclohexamide as well, and those both reduce the number of foci that we see. Um, but as I showed you, cyclohexamide reduces the level of protein significantly. But no, we haven't gone after specific genes. We sort of, um, that's a, yeah, we'll, we'll think about that. So when you, you get a suppression of, of splicing of ribosomal genes, um, do, do you have the same rate, level or rate of suppression of, of intron splicing in other genes, like normal genes? <laughs> um, not all. So we, the, 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 there's microarray data. We've actually done whole proteome data, and um, the primary response is the reduction of ribosomal protein genes. Other genes, like actins, tubulins, seem to be okay. Uh, and not, not suppressed. We, 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 we looked at a specific reporter of uh, um, splicing efficiency that's like a lax ed with an artificial intron in it, and we found that, yeah. that the splicing of that was reduced, but we haven't looked globally. So um, like, that's pretty amazing. So uh, how is that level of specificity uh, achieved there? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it could be a dosage thing where you have, uh, you know, a proportion of spliceosomers are still around, and because you need so little, um, it's, it's enough to, um, I mean, of course, it's the gene expression upstream of splicing that's really regulated by, in this response, right? So if you're still making the ACT1 transcripts or whatever, um, as long as you have a little bit of functional spliceosome around, maybe that's okay. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know. Yeah, I mean, but there's so many ribosomal protein things. You, you think to, to suppress their splicing, you're going to have to really shut it down. I mean, so, yeah, yeah but, well. <clears throat> but, they're gene but they're not transcribed as frequently, yeah. right? Yeah. So. I'm curious about um, if you've looked at the intronless strain and how the dynamics look and uh, response to MMS specifically. 
Uh, no, we haven't. And we, we have some of those strains in the freezer. I don't, there's a pot like all ribosomal protein genes basically that, that it, yeah, all genes in the single, okay. I, I, we're aware of that literature. We haven't looked at it. Yeah. Hey, Peter, good talk. Uh, so, here. Yeah, okay. Hi, Ashik. So, uh, do, can you speculate whether the aggregates are functional still? Or whether or not they're, they're still, well, we don't think that you could still splice in the aggregate. I know there's literature um, suggesting that proteins are still functional in, splices on, or in, in aggregates, but this protein is sort of alone in, um, in the aggregate. There's no other splicing proteins that we can detect that go to these sites. So um, we, we, we're doing kind of FRAP studies and, and you know, protein lifetime studies to try to figure out whether the protein actually comes back and does its job afterwards and whether it, there's communication between the different aggregates because we don't know any of that stuff yet. It could be different pools. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, 